grace and mercy from God, your Heavenly Father, and from His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that I'd like to study with you today is the Gospel reading from Luke 13. It's printed out in the worship folder if you'd like to follow along. I'm assuming you uh, most of the time pay attention to the news, so did you hear about that two-year-old girl that was abducted from Milwaukee? It was a couple weeks ago. I remember I had just fallen asleep and all of a sudden, eh, Amber Alert came across the phone. They found her the following week, wrapped up in a blanket and lying in a ditch in Minnesota. Did you hear about that? I did. That girl deserved no, to die like that? No, she didn't deserve to die like that. It was her father's fault. Did you hear about the cyclone that went through Mozambique, Africa? It's on the eastern coast of Africa. In fact, it went through a couple of countries. I read that it affected millions of people. I think over 700-something have been confirmed dead, but they're thinking there's maybe over 1,000. And, and if you didn't hear about that, maybe you heard about the tornadoes that went through Alabama and some of the, some of the other okay, southern so states in, in the U.S. Did, those people deserve to die from a natural disaster like that? Or how about the shootings at the mosques in New Zealand? Christ Church, New Zealand, ironically. Did, did they deserve to die like that? How about you? Do you deserve to die suddenly and tragically, whether it be from a terrorist act or a, a criminal act or a natural disaster? And, and if, if not, then, then why not? Why, why somebody else and why not me? Well, today in our gospel reading, Jesus discusses some hard questions about local news headlines. And then he goes on to tell a, a parable, an, an earthly story that teaches us uh, something spiritual. And as he's doing those two things, I, I think he pulls together this, this one idea that as long as we're here, God patiently seeks fruit. And we'll have to talk about well, what exactly does that mean, but, but I, I want you to weave through as we, we study this morning. There's a change of thinking, which we pray would lead to a change of heart, and that would lead further to a change of living. And, and that's the fruit that God patiently seeks. So some people came up to Jesus with this local news headline, and Jesus, did you hear about the Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices? Quick geography reminder, you, the nation of Israel at the time of Jesus had three parts. And in the north you had Galilee, that's where Nazareth was, where Jesus grew up. Capernaum was up there, the Sea of Galilee. And then in the middle you had Samaria, and the Jews usually went around Samaria because it was a, a mix of Jews and Gentiles, and they didn't like that. And then in the south you had Judea. Bethlehem and Jerusalem, where the temple was. So apparently some Galileans had come from the north, and this was part of the Old Testament law. They, they were supposed to come and offer sacrifices a few times a year at the temple. And while they're in church, offering their sacrifice to God, Pontius Pilate apparently sends in some soldiers and kills them on the spot. No, no surprise that Pontius Pilate would kill some Jews. He, he was a, a, a mean ruler who used power to control the people, but in the temple, while they're offering sacrifices to God, I mean, this was beyond Pontius Pilate. When Jesus said, well, yeah, and then there was the other incident in Siloam, nearby city, where a tower fell and killed 18 innocent people. But Jesus responds with the same question to both headlines. Do you think that either those Galileans or those people in Siloam were worse sinners than all the rest? That's kind of an interesting question because by the way that Jesus asks it, it, it implies that's exactly what the people were thinking. They were probably all thinking, wow, they must have really done something bad that they, they would die like that. It's kind of like Job's friends. Have you ever read Job? One thing after another happens to Job, and his friends come and say, Job, you must have done something to deserve this. Now, in America and in our world today, we, we tend to be on the opposite side. I mean, really, a two-year-old girl? Her name was Nolani. What could she possibly have done 
to deserve such a death. And, and, and the people in Africa, I don't know anybody in Africa, but does anybody deserve to have a cyclone come through and literally destroy their entire town, leaving thousands of people dead and millions of people in shambles? And even Muslims worshiping Allah in a mosque, but they still don't deserve to have a terrorist come in and shoot them, right? So we, we tend to give everybody the benefit of the doubt and say, well, nobody deserves that. Well, actually, it's not nobody because if you had heard this didn't happen, but, but what if you had heard that the man who killed the two-year-old girl who had killed her mother, I think, the week or two before, what if he had died on the way to the police? What would you say? Most people would say, well, he deserved it. Or when the police shoot the shooter, he had it coming. We do actually think some people deserve it, just not most, and probably not us. And Jesus answers the question. He says that they weren't worse sinners, but then he immediately redirects our attention. It, it's not really for us to worry about what God did with somebody else, but, but he says, let's think about ourselves. And twice, he says it twice, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Let's be clear about the way that God deals with people. Whenever an unbeliever dies, regardless of age or circumstance, it's always judgment. Whenever a believer dies, regardless of age or circumstance, it's always deliverance. Now, I don't know about this two-year-old girl, but, but let's suppose that she had been baptized and that, that by the grace of God, she had faith in Jesus as her Savior and, and she died. Is it really so tragic if a two-year-old would be spared a terrible life on earth and, and get to go early to be with her father in heaven? It's, it's not really so tragic for a believer, is it? But, but again, that's not the point that Jesus wants us to think about. It's us. The reality is, as Sophia told us, we all deserve death. We all deserve suffering. We even deserve hell. And this is where we need a change of thinking. And it's really hard in our world today where we're constantly told what we deserve and rights and this and that and the other thing. And the reality is, is because of our sin, we don't deserve anything good. God has every right at any time to end our time on earth and even to condemn us. That means that every second, minute, hour, day, week, year that God allows us to stay is patient. On God's part, he patiently seeks fruit. So then Jesus tells this story. It's about a man who owned a vineyard, right? A little bit more than a garden, a, a little bit bigger area than that. And, and I don't know about everything he was growing in there, but Jesus says, but he had this one fig tree. And he planted the fig tree, and, and, and he was patient he understood you can't plant a tree and then, and then get fruit right away, but so he gave it a little bit of time. He waited a year, and he came back, and he said, well, I wonder if there's any fruit on my fig tree. And he looked, no, not yet, but it's only been a year. Okay, give it a little bit more time. And he came back the second year, probably a little bit more excited, like, it's been two years. There really should be fruit now. And he came, oh, disappointed, no fruit, this should be, okay. Maybe it's just a late bloomer. Give it another year. He'll come back next year. He comes back the third year, and there's still no fruit. Now his patience has run out. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? That's enough. But the gardeners, just one more year. And I'll dig around it, and I'll fertilize it, and then if it produces fruit, great. That's exactly what you wanted. And if not, yes. The time will come to cut it down. God is the owner of the vineyard. You are the tree. 
God has planted you on earth to do what a tree does and nothing else, and that's to produce fruit. But what does God see when he comes to seek fruit from us? Well, on our own, we cannot produce fruit. Because from the time that we are planted, from the time that we are conceived and born, our tree has been poisoned with sin. And all we produce is more sin. It's greed, it's lust, it's anger, it's discontent. And our fruit, if it comes out at all, it's tiny and it's withered and it's rotting inside and it's full of worms and insects and there's nothing good. But God is patient. He waits. The only problem is that, that God can wait forever. And unless something changes, we on our own would never have been able to produce any big, fat, juicy, lush fruit that is pleasing to God. And so at any time, he can say, chop it down. Put it on the pile for burning. But the gardener steps in. Jesus said, no, 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 wait. Let me do some work. And before Jesus ever comes to work on our tree, on our lives, he becomes a tree himself. Jesus offers to be uprooted from heaven and planted on earth so that he can produce the fruit that God so patiently seeks. And yes, even with Jesus, the Son of God, God has to give him a little bit of time, right? That, that's what we think about right after Christmas. Jesus has to grow up. And I always love the story when Jesus is 12 and he goes to the temple and he's learning God's word and he's teaching God's word. And, and then when he goes home, it, it, the Bible says, and he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with men and with God. Jesus was learning. He, he was blossoming. And by the time he was 30 and he began his ministry, he had produced fruit. And when God the Father came looking for fruit on Jesus' tree, all he could say, and he said it twice, this is my son, I love him, with him I am well pleased. Jesus, no anger, no greed, no lust, no malcontent, just perfect, green, juicy, lush fruit, everything God could have wanted. And yet, the command still comes. Chop it down. Put it on the pile for burning. It wasn't fair. But Jesus offered to take our place as if he was the tree that produced no fruit. In fact, while Jesus was on earth, there was another tree growing that was chopped down and hewn and shaped and fashioned into a cross. And God hung his son there where he suffered the burning wrath of our sin and his body was thrown into the grave lifeless. But that's when the miracle happened. Three days later, God raises his son to life and Jesus, you could say, has now been planted again in heaven, but then he was ready to come and give life to our trees so that we could produce fruit. And so that for most of us, that happens in baptism. And to use a little bit different picture, in John 15, where Jesus says, he is the vine and we are the branches. In baptism, Jesus grafts us into his tree so that he can begin removing our sin and instead replacing it with his life, with himself. And Jesus is giving a similar picture here. He said, I'll dig around the tree. Well, every single time that we are reminded of our sin and what we really deserve for it, Jesus is digging around us and he's removing sin from around us and from within us. And he says, and I'm going to fertilize it. So every time we hear that Jesus lived for us and died for us and rose from the dead, that he forgives our sins and promises us eternal life, he's filling our tree with his life so that now when God comes and he looks to see if there's any fruit on his trees, on you, he finds it. He finds people who now have faith that Jesus is God and Savior. 
He finds people who will come every single week to hear God speak to them and to take away their sin and fill them with his life and to worship him in song and in prayer. He he sees people who go out and seek to love others in the way that God has loved us, and he is pleased. As long as we're here, planted on this earth, We need Jesus to keep digging and keep fertilizing. And the more he does that, the more we hear God's word, the more we will produce fruit that is pleasing to God. The last thought then is what does that look like? As soon as God makes you a healthy fruit producing tree, you're able to now work with Jesus to help other trees. And that starts at home. It starts with moms and dads who bring their children to baptism, who bring them to worship, squirming and crying as they might be, who bring them to family impressions, who sit at home and and again with the squirming kids, read God's word with them and pray and teach them so that Jesus can dig around their hearts and fertilize their hearts and produce fruit in them too. And then when your family is all full and strong and healthy, fruit-producing trees, now you can go out and help others couple easy ways to do that this next week or two. Saturday, and I'm putting in my shameless plug, we're handing out invitations to come to Easter worship. I honestly can't make this any easier for you. We'll put it in a bag, and all I need you to do is walk around the village and put it on somebody's door. And unless they're standing outside, you don't even have to talk to them. But you might have a chance to talk to somebody in the next couple of weeks. And they might come and ask, did you hear about that little girl, or the cyclone, or the tornado, or another shooting, and you ask them, what do you think about that? They'll probably say, they don't deserve that. But then you get to say, well, I understand what you mean. But if we're honest, we all deserve to die for our sin, and and one day we're all going to have to answer to God and That's why it's so important that God sent his son. And if there's ever been a tragic death in this world, it was Jesus dying on the cross. God did that so that he could take away our sin. And so that when death comes, regardless of age or circumstance, however sudden or tragic it might be, we can have confidence that our trees will be planted once again in heaven. And while we're here, God patiently seeks fruit. Friend, would you like to come and hear about the one who gave his life on a tree for you? I pray that God will give you that opportunity because that is exactly the kind of fruit that your fair and yet loving God patiently seeks. Amen. Please stand The peace of God transcends all human understanding. It will guard your hearts and minds in true faith and to life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to join me in confessing the Christian faith. Today we'll use the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen if you need them. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.